And we see in him a model not just for one who has been cured by our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ of his physical infirmities. And there are many miracles along these lines that are recounted in the Gospels. But we see also one who has been granted spiritual sight in addition to physical sight. And this is especially noteworthy for us in light of the juxtaposition of the blind man, St. Celedonius, over and against the Jews, the promised people, the chosen people, who had been given the covenant of Christ in the Old Testament, who foresaw the coming of the Messiah, but when he came in the flesh, could not see him for what he was. And truly, if this gospel reading highlights anything for us, it should be that even those who are given revelation may yet succumb to spiritual blindness if they are not careful to guard that, to cherish that, to nurture that which has been given to them. In the blind man, we do not know why he was born without sight, or so we think. And so the disciples think when they come and see Christ talking to him, they ask, was he born blind because of the sins of his fathers, of his parents? And of course, this was common in the Old Testament, the understanding that the sins of the children can be inherited from the parents. But we have to understand this in a spiritual sense. This is not merely a saying that if the fathers are wicked, their children will be punished. What this truly means, dear brothers and sisters, is that if the children do not learn from the lesson of their parents, if they do not see the wickedness that their parents have subscribed to and turn from it, then they too will suffer the same fate. This is truly what this saying means. But this saying also was misunderstood by the Pharisees. We see three great tests put to the blind man today. We see Christ coming to him and as is different from other miracles, where Christ merely speaks his miracles into existence or merely grants them, in this case, Christ uses material creation to effect a healing. We know from the Gospel account that he bends down, that he scoops up clay, and that he mixes this clay with his spittle, and this is what he anoints the eyes of the blind man with. But it's not enough for Christ to effect his healing in this case. Christ then gives the command Go and wash in the pool of Siloam, which interpreted as being sent. And this should be an example for us, dear brothers and sisters. Christ also comes to us. Christ also grants us healing each and every day. Christ also grants us the cure for our spiritual blindness, if we so will it. But he also gives us a command, dear brothers and sisters. He also tells us to go forth, to be fruitful with that which we have been given, to not waste it, but to use it in his service. Christ tells his disciples that it is his to do the Lord's work. And we heard this just a few weeks ago as well. Actually, just last week, when we hear of the Samaritan woman, we know that... <clears throat> Christ, with the Samaritan woman, as with the blind man, has enlightened her. We know that Christ has given an injunction, and we hope that we will learn from this example as well. Christ speaks to his disciples when they come and they ask, Why was this man blind? Christ says that it is not because of sin, but it was because of my will. It is so that the works of my Father, of God, might be manifest. When we look at the world, we may be tempted to look at the misfortunes that befall one another. We may be tempted to see all of the calamitous things that, that occur in the world. We may be tempted to look at the Ukrainian land or the Serbian land, for whom we pray at every liturgy, and to ask ourselves, why do these things happen? Why are they allowed to happen? Is it because of the sins of the people? This may or may not be. This is not for us necessarily to know. But perhaps the more topical question for us is how do we respond to these things in the world? Do we respond by 
turning the other way and ignoring them, sweeping them under the rug? Do we respond to them by railing against God and accusing him of being unjust? Do we respond to them through prayer, through intercession, through seeking the mercy of God? And ultimately, do we respond to them by taking responsibility for these occurrences in the world and by saying before God in our prayer closet that we, to some extent, are responsible for these things? We're used, dear brothers and sisters, to thinking of the church as the body of Christ, and it is the body of Christ. But in a larger sense, we all, all humankind, comprise a body as well. And when one member of the body hurts, the entire member, the entire body rather, as a result of that hurt also suffers pain. When one portion of the body commits evil, that evil impacts the entirety of the body. And so we truly are interconnected. We truly are responsible for one another. We truly do feel one another's pain. I said earlier that the blind man was subjected to three tests, the first of which was to follow the command of Christ to go and wash in the pool of Siloam. The second was to undergo temptation at the hands of the Jews. If we listen to the gospel narrative, we hear that the Jews were not of one mind. They were of two factions. There was one faction that was, that was tempted to be merciful towards the blind man, that extended the hand of charity to him, and that questioned him, not trying to prove him wrong, to catch him in a falsehood, but sincerely seeking to understand that which had happened to him. And we see his simple but profound answers to them, I do not know how this was done, but it must have been done by a righteous man, because only a righteous man, only one without sin, could accomplish what has been accomplished in me. And even in this, without knowing it, the blind man testifies to Christ because we know that there is only one who is truly without sin. The other faction was not quite as forgiving, was not quite as above board in their questioning. The Pharisees were much more malicious in their interrogation of the blind man. How could this be done on the Sabbath? How dare the Lord and God and Savior of all reach down and fashion sight out of play. Yet we see throughout the Gospels that the Pharisees themselves engaged in work on the Sabbath. We see them leading their animals to water and feeding them, but they could not countenance the Savior of all creation giving spiritual sight and physical sight to one who was bereft of both. We may be tempted, dear brothers and sisters, to look at the blind man and to feel pity for him to ask ourselves, how could anybody endure being without sight? But we look at this from the perspective of those who can see. We might just as easily say that he who had not had something from his birth had not also had the occasion to miss that. We can see perhaps that God left his creation incomplete so that with his coming to the blind man, he might complete that which he had begun. And the fathers speak to this in their testimonies. They say that in scooping clay, in this particular man, Christ completed the fashioning of Adam by giving him his sight, by making him a whole person. And in this sense, it was not the writing of an injustice, it was the completion of something that had been begun but not finished. And this too was done so that the man might learn to see not just with his eyes, but also with the eyes of his heart, with his noose, with his spirit. And it was also given so that others might be edified, might learn from this example. Not just those who witnessed it in that day, but those of us who read the account of this healing 2,000 years after the fact as well. But we see this was not the case with the Jews. It's tempting for us to stand here and to think that the Jews are a people, that they are all worthy of condemnation. But dear brothers and sisters, do we stop to think that we too, in this sense, are Jews? We too persecute our Lord and God and Savior Jesus Christ. We too rail against him. We too refuse to accept, to believe his miracles, even though they occur around us each and every day. Spiritually, most of us, if we are honest, have to admit that we are no different from the Jews. We are no different from the Pharisees. 
and we should tremble at reading their treatment of Christ, because we should see in this an indictment of ourselves as well. This was the second temptation that was endured, or the second test, rather, the temptation of the blind man at the hand of the Jews. His third test by Christ was the test of faith. We know from the Gospel reading that the blind man endured all of the questioning that was put to him. Even when the questioning was turned back upon him by his parents, he did not flinch, he did not change his testimony. He remained steadfast in his glorification of Christ. The third test was Christ coming back to him, revealing who he was, and then accepting the worship offered in faith of the blind man. Perhaps this threefold test should be something that we look to, that we apply to our own spiritual lives, dear brothers and sisters. Are we willing to be sent where Christ would have us to go? Are we willing on this journey and beyond to accept the temptations of the world and to respond to them with meekness, with kindness, and with steadfastness, as did, as did the blind man? And are we willing as the blind man did at the end of today's Gospel reading, to bow down in worship to Christ, to proclaiming him not merely with our mouths, but with the entirety of our being, to be both God and man, to be the source of our salvation. If we are not willing to do this, dear brothers and sisters, then perhaps we too should implore Christ our God to cure our spiritual blindness, so that we might truly see that which is before us, and that seeing it, we might truly come to appreciate it above all else in this world.